Hello there, everybody. I am Captain Jim Palmer, the Dream Business Coach. I'm the founder of the Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program, creator of No Hassle Newsletters, author of these books, which I will tell you how to get for free at the end of the show. But today, most importantly, I'm the host of Dream Business Radio, now in its 10th year. This is episode 547. My special guest is Jesse Ringer. Jesse, how are you today? I'm doing really well. How are you? Good, man. So many people are looking forward to our conversation, so I'm going to get a few things out of the way real quick, and, and we'll hop right to it. So, folks, this episode, no surprise, is brought to you by the Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program. If you're an entrepreneur, a small business owner who wants more growth, faster growth, and especially if you want to learn how to create multiple streams of revenue in your business, something I'm very good at, you want to be part of the Dream Business Mastermind. It's a virtual mastermind. You can get more information at dreambizcoaching.com dreambizcoaching.com. And my latest ebook, by the way, which is called Charge What You're Worth and Work Just Three Days a Week is, is by far my, mo my most popular one. This is my fifth one. I'm actually almost done with the sixth one, which will last, last, which will launch in about a week to 10 days. This one's going off the charts. I think, I don't know, charge what you're worth, work three days a week. Pretty, pretty appealing. But I detail it all, exactly how I created my dream business. You can get a free copy at work3daysaweek.com, work3daysaweek.com. All right, let me introduce Jesse, and we will dive right into today's show. For 10 years, Jesse has helped business owners, entrepreneurs, and marketing teams build winning SEO strategies for their organizations. He works to uncover the formula that will generate more website traffic and more importantly, more conversions and therefore more revenue. Jesse's the founder of Method and Metric, which is an SEO agency based in beautiful Vancouver. And I say that because look over his shoulder at the beautiful trees and, and flowers blooming out there. Anyway, they work with brands, large and small, to improve their search visibility, increase their reach, and again, grow their revenue. Results and accountability are two of their core beliefs that flow through everything they do. Jesse, once again, welcome to Dream Business Radio. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Yeah, Vancouver. How about it? I mean, yeah. probably a little bit more, a little chillier up here than than here in uh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it hasn't been a quick start to spring here. Uh, a lot of rain, which is normal for the Pacific Northwest, but man, like this year has been a bit of a struggle. <laughs> you know, so, um, hey, folks, Jesse and I were just talking before we pushed the go live button. And uh, we originally met about a month ago. And um, and I we talking, we're talking about AI and SEO. And I thought that'd be a good topic. Little did I know AI just exploded. It's what everybody's talking about. So very, very timely. Um, Jesse, first of all, before we dive into the nuts and bolts of what we're going to talk about today. What, tell me a little bit about your entrepreneurial backstory. Did you always want to be a business owner? Did you go to school for accounting or study law and then say, <laughs> heck with that? Like, How did you come to start your own agency? Yeah. I mean, in hindsight, I think it was always something I wanted to do. Um, in high school, I did book reports on how to start a business and entrepreneurship. You did? Wow. I did. Um, but to be honest, it just, it never really seemed like the right career path from the get-go, like uh, going through like university kind of, um, my goal is to find a, a job in like an ad agency where he has a copywriter or some form of like creative in that space. And uh, it was shortly after the 2008 financial crisis. So companies were not as quick to hire uh, new people. And so from there, I kind of found odd jobs uh, writing content and working with them um, in a contract position. And so um, eventually someone that I knew came across my resume and was just like, hey, so you do SEO? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> with a big question mark uh, at the end <laughs> of that one. And uh, it just sort of grew from there. Um, I found that with, uh, with SEO, I could articulate um, you know, my perspective a lot better, especially getting into the workforce. Like if someone had feedback about my writing style or the messaging, um, I didn't really have a good recourse for that. And I found with SEO, having the analytics to back up my viewpoint, um, prove that it was like, it was working, uh, really helped me accelerate that. Very cool. So I want to dive into AI, artificial intelligence, in case you're like me and never heard of it, <laughs> no, you know, unless you've been under a rock for a while. But let's get into the SEO because you really started an SEO agency, right? Yeah. Um, so where do you want to start? I mean, um, 
What's is there? What's new? And first, I want to talk about your um, what's new in SEO. But I also want to talk about your agency experience because a lot of people uh, that I work with, coaches, etc., sometimes they grow beyond their solopreneur roots and they bring on teams. So, so actually, let's go there yeah. instead of telling you what I'm going to tell you. I'll just <laughs> or ask you. I'll just ask you. What are some of the challenges of actually running a team, going from your own solo SEO business at your dining room table or wherever your spare office is, into actually having an agency with a lot of employees? Oh man, um, I think that answer uh, will require more than this time for the show allows. But right, um, give us the three to four minute yeah, version. I would say the biggest challenge is getting comfortable with the fact that people are going to approach problems and doing the work mm. differently than you. Yes. Um, at least for me, it was a bit of a, a struggle to sort of like align with the fact that they're not going to, you know, walk the same path to getting to the solution as you, um, but also being okay with that and, and, you know, ensuring that you trust the people that you're going to work with like that, is really hard when you're building something that is your own. You know, you have to share the responsibility. You also have to share the success and, and the failures of it. And so, uh, yeah, you kind of have to get really comfortable with the fact that things are going to be done differently than you would normally do them. It's a it's a much bigger struggle, and I think entrepreneurs actually think about. Um, one of my gymisms, I guess, is delegate or stay small forever. So if you think you're going to continue to do everything, just give up your dream of a big business because it's impossible. Um, I'll just share one quick tip. Um, one of the things that helped me get comfortable because, you know, in, in my heyday, which is back when I had four or five different businesses and I started coaching, I had about 15 virtual assistants. I'm down to, to maybe, you know, half a dozen now. But at that point, I, I was like, oh, my gosh, I would have done it that way. And I'm like, ah. but I'm like, I'm so one thing I dipped out of all those conversations. I trained and then I let them do what they what, what I trained them to do. But mm -hmm. the other thing which helped me just from a mindset standpoint is I figured if the people that I hire and train and therefore give it and put in charge of a task, if they can do it 80 percent as good as I can, then. I'm off to the races, right? They're never going to be me. Everybody, oh, can I just, you know, can I clone myself? That's not not possible, right? So if they can do it 80% as good as me, that allows me to move on to higher revenue generating activities. So that's how I did it. Um, did you start out with, um, say, virtual assistants or did you just start hiring people? Uh, I started with contractors. Okay. Yeah. So I'd, uh, we got, I got to a point where, you know, doing a lot of the, the more tedious SEO tasks, like, writing image alt texts or meta tags and things like that became just a bit too cumbersome and, and time consuming. So I started delegating out to contractors where it was kind of like a fixed deliverable. Um, we both had the same outcome in mind and it didn't really matter how they got to the end result. So that was one way that I got comfortable like that, uh, going that way. And then, um, yeah, I, I brought in a virtual assistant to kind of handle a lot of the admin stuff. Mm -hmm. a lot later than maybe I should have in hindsight, because yeah. there's a lot of things, you know, getting contracts signed, following up clients on payments and then, you know, making sure that all of that stuff is well taken care of was something that I was very reluctant to give up control on. And so it was uh, a bit slower than I think I should have. Yeah. So SEO, you know, search engine optimization, it's a it's a really multifaceted deal. It's all designed so your stuff gets noticed amongst the billions of other things out there. And it involves keywords and, um, as you said, meta tags and things like that. So mm -hmm. a lot of people that watch Dream Business Radio or, or listen to it on, on the replay are solopreneurs, entrepreneurs. Maybe they've got a team of two or three to five. So I, you know, most of the people that, that listen to the show don't have 25 employees in, in multi divisions. That, that's not who my audience is. So for a small business owner and even um, solopreneurs that are posting their own blogs and things like that, can you give maybe just a few tips on, you know, what you should do as far as keywords, meta tags and things yeah. like that? Yeah, I'd say, I mean, first and foremost, do your research, uh, figure out what keywords not only matter to your business, but also like what people are using to search for you. Um, you know, search volume shouldn't be the only metric that you're looking at. You should look at competitiveness, uh, relevancy, 
you know, and how accurate it is to your core service offering. Like uh, one example I'd say is like, you know, a good keyword for us hypothetically would be SEO consultants in Vancouver. Okay. But we're not consultants, we're a full fledged agency. And so for us to try and rank for that term wouldn't be really worth our while because the, the person that is looking for a consultant versus a person that is potentially looking for an agency are going to have very different needs. And so we want to make sure that we're clearly aligned on, on the messaging because it's all well and good to rank for keywords, but if they don't help generate more leads or more revenue for you, those keywords are effectively kind of useless. Right, so, the right kind of, the right kind of, you know, the right keywords for matching the right audience is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. So find the right search intent with it, you know, figure out um, and like go into the search results yourself and see what they, they say and what they're showing it there, because um, that's going to make more sense for a person searching. Like if they click on a result and the content on your website doesn't match what they had in mind for their search, they're going to leave. And so you want to make sure that all of that is in tune with the keywords that you're using. Okay. Hey, I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit. We'll test your knowledge. <laughs> Don't be worried. All right. All right. Okay. So when you just said um, uh, some people search for SEO consultants, but that's not you, you're an SEO agency, right? So that's really being clear on who you are. But I'm curious if, if you looked into the difference between some of the people who may have searched for an SEO consultant, meaning they really wanted to hire a consultant to do it for them. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If that's the language your prospective customers are using, you shouldn't ignore that keyword or, or am I oversimplifying it? No, that's a great point too. Like, okay. You know, if you realize that, you know, hypothetically, nobody searches for SEO agencies, right? They only use the word consultant. Then mm -hmm. maybe you need to reposition your, idea of what your business is, but also like the content and messaging on your website altogether, for sure. Yeah. Very good. Um, so unless you've been living under a rock, everybody, you know, you've heard about AI and how it's changing the way business is being done. I don't, I don't think even the sharp, sharpest uh, person fully understands what AI is and, and what it's doing. I mean, it, just me in the last few weeks, I'm learning Wow, that can be a really good tool for research, for looking for phrases, keywords, and even writing a blog post or two, or at least getting the skeleton of it done. What is what is AI? And then let's talk about how it specifically works in your business, the, the SEO business. Sure. Uh, I mean, AI, in my view, is um, you know uh, a mechanism for learning information quickly, but also you know outputting content and creative components um, pretty quickly and at scale. Um, obviously, that's a pretty basic way of describing it. But mm -hmm. um, in the sense of like content creation and SEO, it allows us to quickly scale repetitive, low value tasks in a way that helps us become more efficient. Um, to put that more clearly, like you can have it write you a blog post, which I would highly recommend not doing, but you could have it write your content for you. You could have it create all of your offers. It could have you, you could have it create your newsletter content and anything that you needed uh, on your website or any marketing component. But the issue with that, I think, is uh, the content is not overly original. Like the, the content that they're pulling from is from a database that is quite a few years old. And everyone that is using the same prompts are going to get relatively close to the same answer. What is that database? I mean, in a way, when you're typing in, um, it's almost like doing a Google search in a way, except Google would return other things that are out there, articles, books, videos, whatever. And this is saying, well, here's what you're looking or here's a good way to phrase that. It may give you some ideas. But how do you how would you know if that's SEO? For, how does can you trust AI to produce SEO stuff? Or again, is it giving you the bare bones and you got to, you know, put the meat on the bones? Yeah. I mean, there are people that are ranking a lot of good content using AI, but at the same time, Google's moving quickly to ensure that the content that is produced by these chatbots, um, it doesn't get as much ranking value as content that is created by people. Um, recently, like, I think it was 
the end of last week, Google announced some changes to their terms of service in terms of like, they are going to be rewarding content that is kind of laced or integrated with experiences. And that's something that AI can't reproduce just yet. But, you know, they're looking at, you know, how human and how interpersonal like the content is in order for it to be deemed good and valuable for, from a search engine perspective. Whenever I have a guest on, I like to have at least a limited knowledge so I don't sound completely you know, ill-equipped, but I feel like I'm completely ill-equipped in this conversation, but I trust you. It seems like Google and, and other search engines, um, are they, how do they feel about AI? Or is it like, who cares? It's a different type of content. I mean, how does, how does they work together? Oh yeah. I mean, well, Bing is a big investor in ChatGPT and has integrated oh. that into its search results. Uh, Google has released Bard, which is another version of this ChatGPT. It, it will influence. And I believe at some point, you know, take over how search results are produced, um, especially in a general knowledge kind of space. But the issue that Google has come up against numerous times is how do they credit the creators of that content? Mm. You know, if the creators don't get credit and in Google's eyes, it's like the blue link that sends traffic, you know, why, what is the incentive for them to produce content and share their information with Google? If Google is making money off of those search results, but not sharing the wealth, so to speak, um, what's the incentive for anyone to allow Google or Bard or ChatGPT to like crawl and access their information? Um, so another um, naive question perhaps, but is would chat um, or, or other AI platforms eventually, would they replace search engines? Could they, or, I mean, is Google like, holy crap, two years down the road or five years down the road? I, th I think it'll depend on how quickly the AI can crawl the web from what i've been reading especially from a search perspective like it takes a lot of power and money to scrape the internet and if it's to do that on a daily basis the way that google is able to um the way that google can produce news results or tweets that have happened like less than an hour ago um if Bard and ChatGPT are to do that, it's going to require a ton of money and a ton of resources in order to be able to consolidate all that information, parse whether or not it's factual, and then produce it in a way that people will consume it. So, I, so I you keep saying, Jesse, you keep saying Bard and, and Chat. Is, is Bard, B-A-R-D, is that another form of AI? Mm -hmm. Are they two different That's AI Google's companies? version of ChatGPT. I see the name of their yeah. So it's relatively new. I think they re did a limited release a couple of weeks ago for testing, but uh, yeah, it's it's gonna probably take over because it just it improves a lot of experiences. Um, but I think there's gonna need to be a balance around uh, rewarding the creators of that content as well. How do they? How do the creators like barter? or chat, how are they going to be remunerated? Like, why are they doing this? What's in it for them, so to speak? I think it produces cleaner, clearer results. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's engaging. It's easy for people to have a conversation with it and kind of dig deeper much more simply than the current structure of Google's searches. And so... Yeah, I think that it's just, it is a better experience at the end of the day, you know, for, for someone that is looking for, I don't know, recipes or movie recommendations or what have you, like those kinds of things, it's just a nicer, nicer experience. And that's all okay. we're going to gravitate towards. Um, I don't want to ask anything proprietary, but are you and your team doing anything differently now to work and either harness the power? Is it helping you become a better mm -hmm. SEO agency or is it like, oh, my gosh, we better figure all this out because, you know, we're going to keep going down this road over here? Yeah, I think uh, it would be naive of us not to be considering AI and the implications of it. But presently, we 
only really use it for like low value type work. Um, so filling alt text, uh, creating meta tags for thousands of products, um, you know, building out frameworks and kind of like a, a brief for some content. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, you know, we're still quite hands on with the, the work that we're doing as we want to make sure that the content is best suited for the clients that we're working with. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me see. Jeff Herring's a big content market. Let's see. Some AI tools produce what I'd call generic content. What are some of the best prompts to get better content delivered by AI? Oh, that's a great question, Jeff. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Jesse, every day you, you turn on YouTube or whatever, and there's like 22 more. I'm the AI expert you've been waiting for. I will, I'm going to sell you my 5,000 prompts that you can. Like, yeah. What are those? Just questions <laughs> or are they legitimate? And what are, you know, as, as Jeffrey was asking, what are some of the better prompts to use to get high quality content? Yeah. That's a great question because, you know, we're always trying to find find better ways to do that as well. Because you know, it, if a person released five hundred prompts, like, and a thousand people start using them, then that content stops being unique, right? Mm. Um, and so, I would say try and find unique combinations or like almost like abstract references. And I know that's super fake, but like try and consider like, how would you approach this topic if you were, I don't know, an inanimate object or something and try and find creative ways to like build off that. Because if you're going from those lists that other websites are touting as their best prompts, like the content is going to be kind of generic. And mm -hmm. so I think going more obscure will help you one get more creative with your own thinking but also force you know the ai to to get more creative with their responses as well so can ai i mean you can ask it i guess that would well if you use the correct language it's prompt asking a question can you ask it to what are some great keywords to help with seo of and then fill in the blank or what are great meta tags to use for a website that sells so is that what it does? I mean, does it actually yeah. figure it out or does it go find it? Yeah, it, it that's a great question. I'm I testing that. Like, I mean, I'm sure. it, it is pulling from, you know, thousands and thousands of sources, right? Okay. And so it is coming up with its own idea about what those are to be or what is the best. Yeah, it's pulling from all of the different sources to formulate a response. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just uh, pulling from one website's list of top 10 terms you should rank for the best way to write a description. It's going to pull based on the data it has in its database to create like the best possible result for the prompt you're asking. Okay, I'm going to pull this up, but it looks very long. I haven't read the whole thing, but I, I know. <laughs> Let's see. The better you ask the question or prompt, the better the result. AI, all that said, I think she means all that said, the AI tool can be an experience. So this needs to be messaging by the human. So I think Peg's saying it's a great start. It's, it is building the good bones and, and maybe putting meat on that. I think that's the message there. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, totally. It's like, you know, why do you buy from a business? Why do you, you know, keep, you follow their, subscribe to their newsletter or follow them on Facebook? Like mm -hmm. there is intimates over dramatic, but there is a connection that you have with a brand. And as soon as that starts to feel not natural, because all of their content is instantly written by a robot. Yeah, you know, the brand, you can't fake a brand just yet. I mean, people try, but it, it isn't sustainable. And so I think the, the companies that do well and have longevity, are human and like their customers and clients do business with them because they like them. And if you start removing that layer of, of connection and personality, yeah, yeah, it's, it's going to slowly erode the trust and, and the comfort that people have doing business with you. Yeah. One of my, um, 
pet peeves, not to get on this road, but evidently I am, is you see, <laughs> here's, um, you can buy all these articles that can be yours. This will help promote your coaching business. So in other words, you're buying somebody else's written words about leadership, about marketing, about whatever it is, and make it yours. I think that's like, it should be almost criminal, to be honest with you. Besides that, it's not you. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I've known somebody's very, I'm very prolific. So I've written tons of books. I mean, I can't tell you how many words I've written in, in over 22 years and good, bad or otherwise. It's me. It's my story. It's the way I talk. I can't imagine using some taking somebody else's stuff and putting it out as your own. Is that sort of what AI does as well? Yeah. it. I mean, it does strip out that that connection. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, yeah, people want to do business and interact with entities whatever they are that they like, know, and trust. And if you feel that the messaging is like just, you know, a cookie version that has been gone from like an SEO company to a newsletter company, and we just switched out those two words, mm. people are going to catch on. It might work for a little bit, but I don't think it's sustainable. Yeah. Um, Jesse, you have a, a pretty good blog post. Not pretty. You have a very good blog. Let me say that. And one of the posts, <laughs> one of the posts is titled "The Impact of Updating Older Blog Posts for SEO." And I told you before I went on. I mean, we've I've had a blog at least since 2006. So you know, however many years that is. I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds of posts. I put them up constantly. Should I go back? And like, see what's non-relevant and updated, or do I just keep putting out new material? Uh, yeah, I think you should go back because the way that Google, from an SEO perspective anyway, like Google ranks content that is fresh and new and, I mean, interesting. Okay. But at the same time, you know, content that might have ranked really well in the past is going to like dilute over time. And so by going back and refreshing that content, one, you get to add a new perspective to it. You also get to kind of signal to Google that this content is still relevant and interesting. And we've just added some new context, you know, for the year that you're writing it. And so also like from a, you know, resource perspective, it's way more time efficient to, yeah. you know, update an old post and then, you know, than writing a new one. So it's really worthwhile, both from a search perspective, but from a resource planning perspective, you know, you already have content that people have already, you know, liked and engaged with. This just brings it to a new audience with like fresh information. Well, I've tapped my brain on, on uh, AI questions. So let me go back to SEO real quick. We got about three minutes left. Cool. What are some of the KPIs, key performance indicators to help measure the SEO work that you're doing. In other words, if you're doing all these different things, how do, how do you know? Most people, I, I will confess, I am revenue driven. I, I do monitor expenses, but I am revenue driven. That's what I do. But I'm not, not, I'm not always looking. Somebody would apply to be a guest on my podcast. How many downloads? I have no clue. I just, I just don't look at numbers like that, you know? Yeah. So somebody who is numbers driven, perhaps, how do you know if the SEO work you're doing is, is actually paying dividends initially? Yeah. So there's, I think I consider kind of two levels of KPIs for this, obviously revenue and leads. That's an obvious one um, because people are finding your business, finding your website and they like what they see and they're taking action before you can get to that point though. We want to look at, you know, using Google analytics, um, Hopefully everyone has that on their right. website. Uh, you would want to be tracking like number of page views, um, how many pages people are visiting, entrances, specifically from Google, obviously from an SEO perspective, but from a broader sense too. Like if you're creating blog posts, you know, and sharing them on your socials, like how many people are coming from those socials? You know, what does that content look like uh, from that perspective? At a, you know, a, more high level look like keyword rankings matter. You know, the number of terms that you rank for does, you know, have a correlation to the performance of your SEO. Um, search impressions, the number of times your website has appeared in Google search results is a good bellwether of, you know, how your content is ranking. Mm -hmm. Obviously clicks from Google matter a great deal. Um, but yeah, getting a sense of like, 
what where your rankings are you know what terms do you actually rank for is a good idea a good sense of like you know how your seo is doing um but ultimately i think it, it's revenue then clicks and traffic impressions and, and keyword rankings like that's awesome yeah. That's a great answer too. Google Analytics. There's so much information there oh, yeah. if you care to go look once in a while. Jesse, what a great, what a great half hour. Thank you so much. How can people connect with you, learn more about you and your digital yeah. uh, SEO agency, not to be consu confused with a consultancy? <laughs> yeah, great. Um, I mean, the easiest place uh, to get into contact with me directly uh, is LinkedIn, uh, Jesse Ringer. Um, yeah, I'm on there. Always happy to connect there. You can also check us out at methodandmetric.com. Uh, we have tons of free resources, uh, tons of blog content as well. Uh, we're always happy to, to connect there too and chat. Great. Thank you so much, Jesse. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Jim. Yeah, man. Hey, hey, the folks, that wraps up this very special interview. Very uh, information brain packed. One of my more uh, in-depth interviews, I would say. I handled it pretty well, if I do say so. <laughs> Jesse's a great guest. That's all him. Hey, that wraps up this interview, as I said, with Jesse. You can connect with me at getjimpalmer.com. If you're interested in joining me and about 27 other smart entrepreneurs in my Dream Business Mastermind group, again, you go to dreambizcoaching.com, Dream B I Z coaching.com. If you're interested again in getting a copy for free of my latest book, ebook called Charge What You're Worth and Work Just Three Days a Week, you can get a copy of that at work 3 daysaweekcom Remember, you can get free digital versions of my six books either as uh, at Amazon in the Kindles, obviously, or at Barnes & Noble as Nook Books. They are also in the iBook store, but that's it. Until this time next week, another fantastic interview. I'm Captain Jim Palmer. I am the Dream Business Coach, and you take good care.